Yep, it's good. Okay. Uh, can you see me advancing? Yep. Okay, so again, uh, let me know if there's any problems. So uh, yesterday, Dr. Gupta asked me to talk about something, if possible. So I said, yeah, this lecture, I gave it maybe two years ago or uh, three years ago. It's the anatomy of the pterygopalatine fossa. And uh, it's a very nice area because as you see on this graph, why is it important? This is, this is why. So any tumor in the sinonasal cavity can, whether it's a uh, an orbital tumor or sinonasal tumor, you, you can see those percentages. 35% of the tumors of the orbit involves the pterygopalatine fossa. Any tumor of the maxilla, 42%, sinonasal, 23%, and the primary tumor of the pterygopalatine fossa itself is 19%. So it was named pterygopalatine fossa because of the pterygopalatine ganglion in it, okay? Again, can you still see the screen? We see it. Okay, so we'll continue. So uh, basically, this is what we're going to be presenting. We're going to go quick. Mostly, it's the anatomy of the fossa, which is important, the opening and the different uh, uh, foramina that we have. The contents is going to be quick and some imaging, surgical approaches. If we have any time, just we can do those. So for the bone, let's just uh, skip this, uh, this one. So for the bones, as you can see, it is hidden behind the maxilla, so you cannot see, see it. You can, unless there's a gigantic tumor, but this is a, a fossa that is basically hidden. You have to uh, dislocate and disassociate all the bones to be able to see that the fossa is just hidden behind this maxillary sinus where the pointer is. So this is a look from the side. This is the right side after you remove the uh, TMJ. So to access the fossa, you have to go through the infratemporal fossa, which is here, and you have to go through the pterygopalatine fissure uh, to reach it. So here, this is the uh, sphenopalatine foramen. It's going to be the, the foramen at the deep end that connects it to the nasal cavity. And then, as you can see here, you have the inferior, uh, the infraorbital fissure up front, which is, connects it with the orbit. And then you have the infratemporal fossa on the side, uh, right underneath the zygomatic arch. So you have to go through the infratemporal fossa, through the pterygopalatine fissure to reach it. It's, it's almost impossible to access it from the side without major uh, surgeries. This is a very important slide with the boundaries of the pterygopalatine fossa. So we know, but we have to know them. So it's a it's a similar if you're like in the attic or the tegmen. You have the six boundaries, superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral. So anteriorly, if you're sitting, let's say you stand in this fossa, you have the, uh, you, in front of you, it's going to be the, the maxilla. So anteriorly, it's bordered by the maxilla. Posteriorly, it's the base of the pterygoid and the sphenoid. Medially, you will see it's the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. You know the palatine bone is a bone that ha has an L-shaped, it has the perpendicular plate, and it has a horizontal plate. You, you will see it. The horizontal plates of the palatine bone, they fuse to form the posterior third of the heart palate. So the medial border of the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone, laterally, it's basically the pterygopalatine uh, maxillary fissure, which is this one here that connects it to the infratemporal fossa. Superiorly, as we said, it's a sphenoid and the orbital process of the palatine bone, and inferiorly, you see the pyramidal process, the palatine bone, they fuse, so it doesn't communicate inferiorly because everything fuses, and you have the greater and lesser palatine foramen, foramina that we see. So there's a, this is a very interesting uh, uh, paper published in, uh, uh, I, th I think, maybe 15 years ago uh, in the Neuroradiology Journal, and it can describe the in very beautifully, the anatomy of the pterygopalatine fossa. So if you're looking at the, the one here, let's look at the one on the left. So this is a view of the sphenoid uh, uh, bone. This is the sphenoid sinus that you can see, the left sphenoid sinus. This is vidian, superior lateral to it, you have the rotundum, which where V2 comes, uh, comes through, greater fissure, inferior fissure, and this is as you see here, the medial plate, and here the lateral plate. In between, you have the pterygoid uh, muscles, which 
you know, uh, there. So this is basically the pterygopalatine fossa, but to be able to see it, it is hidden behind the palatine bone. Can, can you see those pictures and the animation? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so ba basically this is what you see. The palatine bone is this yellow bone that is uh, an L shape and it covers, it's just, it's the bone in front of the sphenoid bone and it formed this cavity, which is about six to eight millimeter deep. And this is the, as you see here through this arrow, just to assess the depth, this is the pterygopalatine fossa. As we see here, you have medially the vidian canal superior and lateral, you have the rotundum. Usually the distance between the two is six millimeters, five millimeters, seven millimeters, something like that. In the majority of the cases, the 70%, the, the, the actual vidian canal is medial to the perpendicular, to the medial pterygoid plate, okay? If we go here, we can see the medial plate Usually it is medial to it in most of the cases, 25% it is lateral to the medial plate. And this is the view from the side. We can go a little bit fast in here. Again, it is hidden deep, deeper to the infratemporal fossa. So to access it, you have to remove the mandible, you have to remove the parotid, the masseter, and you have to remove the zygoma, and it's hidden deep. And you can see the yellow in, on the screen is the, is the palatine bone seen from the side. And this is the very common view that we see because it's a lot easier to access this area endoscopically. Um, okay, so we can see here, this is the view on the left side. This is the maxillary sinus uh, on the left, posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and this is the palatine bone with the perpendicular plate. You can see here, this is the, called the conchal crest, which is the crest of the attachment of the inferior turbinate. And this is the sphenopalatine foramen. And uh, uh, those are the important landmarks, the orbital process of the palatine bone and the sphenoid process on the palatine bone. Along with the sphenoid bone, they form the sphenopalatine foramen, okay? And this is a view from the, from the side, a sagittal view. Uh, anytime you look at the CT scan of the sinuses, try to enjoy really looking at the anatomy of the, of those, uh, of the cavities. So this is the pterygopalatine fossa, and you always have the greater palatine canal anteriorly and the smaller one behind it, the lesser palatine canals, and you have the vessels and the nerves in those canals as well. And this is the view from uh, inferior, greater palatine foramen up front, see the lesser palatine foramen in the back, and you can see in yellow, this is the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Both of them, they fuse together and they form the posterior third of the heart palate. And the anterior two thirds are formed by the fusion of the palatine, you know, the, the, the maxillary crests. And this is the one that is a landmark anytime we do sinus surgery and it's very important for the boards. So if we look at this, uh, separately, you can clearly see the most important one is the one on top. So if we look at this picture, this is again a standard picture for our boards and for any sinus surgery we do. So we are in the sphenoid sinus as you see. This is an intersinus septum and it's very important to have the septa and the sinuses in a vertical direction. If you have one in, in a horizontal direction, you have to think about an anode cell or something like that. So you can see here this is superior lateral, it's always the, the rotundum. Medial inferior is always vidian. The distance between them is about five, six millimeters. In 10, 15% of the cases, the vidian canal is dehiscent in the sphenoid sinus. So when you're doing any sinus surgery, 10, 15%, if you're super aggressive, you can hit this nerve and the patient may have some dryness of the eyes. And this is, as you know, medial plate, lateral plate, and this is what we call the pterygoid space, is the space between the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. And this is what we call the base of the pterygoid. This is a very important area that you have if you're uh, doing surgery for uh, the, the JNA. Hopefully we have some time to discuss it this afternoon. The JNA, it's very important to drill this part because this is the area of the most 
uh, the most uh, recurrences. All of us, we remove the JNAs, but usually it is attached here and this needs to be cleared. If we go a little bit up front, same thing. Again, you can see Vidian Canal on this, this area and we have Rotundum and uh, there. And we go up front. This is basically the Therigopalatine fossa. And we go a little bit more up front and you can see inferior turbinate with the conchal crest and the middle turbinate. And you can see here, this is the great palatine frame. And as we know, this is the L-shaped, as you see, the lacrimal bone, and this is the horizontal plate of the lacrimal bone. And this is the orbital process and the sphenoid process of the palatine bone. And here it's gonna be a bit between the sphenopalatine foramen. And as I said previously, the palatine bone, they fuse together to form the posterior third of the heart palate. And this is uh, also an axial view and it's extremely important as you see on this picture if we start front to back this is the nasal lacrimal uh, duct and this is the as you see the septum middle turbinates on the side uh, maxillary sinus maxillary sinus and this is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus this is the infratemporal fossa or on the side which is and this is a zygomatic arch pterygomaxillary fissure, and this is the pterygopalatine fossa, again, limited, bordered anteriorly by the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And here you can see there's it's a bone defect, which is the sphenopalatine foramen. And this is another picture. If we go lower, inferior turbinate septum, and this is greater palatine foramen up front, lesser palatine foramen in the back. As I said earlier, this is medial plate. This is a lateral, lateral plate, and in between, you have what's called the pterygoid space, which has the muscle. And this is an example of a patient who had a polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma. This is a superior view, and this is the right maxillary sinus in its entirety in the specimen. This is the bulging of the tumor, inferior turbinate, septum is here, and this is, you can see, this is the border, posterior border of the maxillary sinus, and this is, as you see here, medial plate, lateral plate, and this is the pterygopalatine fossa completely here in this specimen. The openings are very important. So as I said, it's a structure that it's a, uh, it's a place like uh, has six boundaries, superior, inferior, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior. So if you're standing in it, and if you look superiorly, it's the inferior orbital fissure that connects it to the, with, with the orbit and the skin. Inferiorly, you have the greater palatine foramen, lesser palatine foramen, and you have the posterior superior alveolar foramen. Medially, you have the sphenopalatine foramen. Laterally is the pterygomaxillary fissure that connects it with the infratemporal fossa. And posteriorly, you have rotundum and vidian. And this is the pharyngeal canal is present in about 10% of the cases. Fin. I hope you can see just simple the animation there. It's basically repetition. And uh, this is one of the anatomists in, in Canada. He used to give the lecture on the, of the pterygopalatine fossa. And this is how, uh, you know, he had the drawings of it. So basically, I took the same thing. This is looking from the side on the right. This is the right side of the patient. You can see the number five here, the extension is the infraorbital fissure. And in the back, we have uh, rotundum, vidian, and the pharyngeal canal. Four is medial, the sphenopalatine foramen. You don't see the pterygo uh, fissure, pterygomaxillary fissure. And six is the superior, as we said, you have three, six, seven, eight are the three inferior openings. Greater palatine with seven, lesser palatine with eight, and the posterior superior alveolar nerve is number six. And this is, it looks like this. For the, all of you guys who like animals, just a repetition, this is my giraffe. This is uh, a trademark picture. So it's exactly as it's envisioned in here. So those are the different openings of the pterygopalatine fissure. And if the giraffe sticks her <laughs> tongue out, it will be the infraorbital nerve. So anteriorly, as we said, the infraorbital fissure, and posteriorly you have vidian, rotundum, and pharyngeal canal. Medially, as I put here in number four, is the 
sphenopalatine foramen, six is the pterygomaxillary fissure, seven, eight, greater and lesser palatine foramina. This is a bony anatomy from uh, looking medially. This is the sphenopalatine foramen with those important crusts. Posteriorly, you have the sphenoid crust of the palatine bone. Anteriorly, you have the orbital crust. And in between, you have the sphenopalatine foramen. And if we put some uh, vessels in there, so you can see the sphenopalatine artery is the end artery of the IMAX. And in about 85% of the cases, as you see in this picture, it splits, usually it splits in two before exiting the foramen. So it's very important. Uh, it's a very important, it usually splits in two and the major posterior is the posterior septal and the one that goes to the front are basically anterior and lateral uh, nasal arteries. All of you guys know this flap that they started it about maybe 12 years ago and uh, we can go very, 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 very quickly through that. You see it with me, Comer, or Saini uh, being elevated. So you can go with your incisions here, as you see superiorly. Here the incision was made right at the inferior border of the septum, but as you see on the dotted lines, you can extend it uh, in here, and you can go a little bit further laterally all the way inferior to the inferior turbinates. And when I went to the skull base meeting this year, uh, the same group are describing a flap simply based on this inferior turbinate for reconstruction of the septum. If you have septal defects, you can make your incision, as you see here in this dotted line, and you remove this part, the mucosa, keep it pedicled on, they call it the posterior uh, lateral uh, artery, and then you can swing this mucosa to reconstruct anterior septal defects. I have the link uh, for, of this article if you guys are interested in, again, reconstruction of the skull base and we move on. And this is an anterior view. You can see here the infraorbital nerve, as you see, go through the infraorbital fissure and uh, you can see the zygomatic nerve as well. And this is the superior orbital fissure we're not gonna discuss at this time. And in inferior view, you can see the incisive foramen you have the suture with the torus palatini, as you see there, and this is the posterior third of the heart palate, which is formed by the fusion of the horizontal plates of the palatine bone. You have the greater palatine foramen, lesser palatine foramen in there. And this is very important, you know, those flaps, the greater palatine artery, that uh, you can uh, use different flaps uh, to reconstruct soft uh, heart palate defects like in clefts, and the posterior view is very important as well because this explains in kids with cleft palate uh, the process, how they can have serous otitis media in almost 90% or 100% of the cases with the insertion of the levator, which is missing, and uh, the tensor does not insert uh, anteriorly, doesn't have an ankle point, so when the tensor is loose, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, function well and the kids have serous otitis media. And this is a view from the side and this is the right side. You can see here the sphenoid sinus with the intersinus septum in between. And this is simply showing vidian, as you see here, and this is rotundum, and this is the, the, the uh, pharyngeal canal, as I said. These are the three openings posteriorly of the pterygopalatine fossa. And if we go anterior, so this is Vidya, the Vidyas. He was a physician. He was a professor of medicine about 500, uh, 500 years ago. And he was uh, the, the personal physician of the King of France back then. And he's the one who described Vidyan Canal. Uh, and as you see on the slide, you have two important numbers to uh, remember. The length of the canal is about 10, 12 millimeters. And you have to understand you can drill the canal but just it's extremely important if you look at the second number, the carotid, which we call it, you know, the, uh, the petrous carotid is about two millimeters at the posterior end of that, can, of that bony canal. So you can drill it, but you have to keep at least one, two, three millimeters of bone to be sure that the carotid, internal carotid is still four millimeters away from you. And this is also uh, one for the boards. 
as you see here, again, nasolacrimal duct start front to back, nasolacrimal duct, concha bullosa in the middle turbinate, and this is the maxillary sinus. You can see here the pterygopalatine fossa. This is the pterygomaxillary fissure, infratemporal fossa on the side, and this is Vidian Canal. In 90% of the cases, it goes medial to lateral in direction, measuring about, as I said, 12, 14, 13 millimeters, as you see here in yellow, and the internal carotid is here in red. And as you see here, it's almost attached to it. So it's the average is two to four millimeters, the distance between the posterior bone and the petrous carotid. And you can see here, this is, anybody? This is ovale. And spinosum should be a small little dot behind it, and we'll see it on a different slide. We can skip the ones from the side, uh, you know. And this is a nice view also, looking from the top, as you see here, we have V3, V1, V2, and V3 with ovale. And then this is the internal auditory canal when you have seven up, anterior superior. And this is the geniculate ganglion, out of which we have the greater superficial petrosal nerve. It's going to be a meeting with the lesser petrosal nerve to form the vidian nerve. And this is the same thing. Again, it's a look from the right side. You can see internal canal should be here. And this is the geniculate ganglion, out of which we have the greater petrosal, superficial petrosal nerve. As you see, it's going to be meeting the sympathetic of the uh, greater, the deeper petrosal nerve to form the vidian in this canal. So you can see from this border to the carotid, it's about two, four millimeters. And the canal is about 13 millimeters in length. And it's going to go to the pterygopalatine ganglion, which is the largest parasympathetic ganglion of the head and neck. And this is the same thing from the side. And as you see here, this is the canal about 12, 14 millimeters and two, three millimeters to the carotid. And this is a very, very important slide, the different foramina. So you can start here with the infraorbital nerve. This is the nasolacrimal duct, sphenopalatine nerve. This is the vidian canal. The big arrow is the ovale and the smaller arrow is spinosum. And this is petrous carotid. This is the inferior orbital fissure, and this is rotundum, inferior orbital fissure. If we go higher, uh, and this is the pterygobatine fossa, and we go one cut higher, this is the superior orbital fissure. And this is also an important view when, when, when you're doing any surgery in the nasopharynx. The safe area, if you take this as a circle like a clock, with the vidian is the center of that clock. On the right, on the patient's left side, which is on our right, it is safe to stay between six and nine, okay? So this zone is safe, six and nine. And it's nine on the left side, which is our left, the patient's right, it is safe to go three to six. So, or if you can go, you know, six to three on one side, and the other side is six to nine. And another repetition, vidian nerve is in the vidian canal, parasympathetic along with sympathetic. And this is the carotid, and this is the petrous portion, and C4 is the cavernous portion around, around the cavernous sinus. Again, this is uh, the group of Pittsburgh. So on the patient's left, as you see, it's safe to be six to nine. Contents, as you know, we have nerves, we have arteries, we have a plexus of veins, and we have fat. So we can go a little bit quick here. We can skip those, uh, those parts just to show you one uh, that is very, very important. So this is a very one that we see very commonly when we do open or endoscopic. This is the, the medial wall of the sinus. The posterior wall has been removed. The fat has been removed, and you can see this is rotundum, which is superior lateral to vidian nerve, and the distance about like three, four, or five millimeters in between. And this is, you see, the IMAX that gives the sphenopal, and the sphenopal is already branched in two before it exits the foramen. And this is an endoscopic view, as you see in this picture, when you're elevating, this is the patient's left side, when you're elevating the mucosa, you can see the sphenopalatine foramen, through which exits the sphenopalatine artery. 
this is a nice view from the top. It's important when you're doing a middle cranial fossil of Dr. Bush to see the, uh, uh, the greater superficial petrosal because it's a landmark uh, that takes you towards the facial nerve and the, the internal auditory canal. 10-15% you have the facial hiatus that may be dehiscent. And this is a very nice view as well as you see. This is, uh, the, this is the greater superficial petrosal nerve that is meeting with the deep petrosal nerve forming the vidian nerve. The view from the side, if we go, it's very important as, uh, as we said, we have nerves, we have arteries and we have uh, veins and we have lots of fat and this is what causes the problem. Regarding the arteries, uh, the good thing about the arteries and the pterygopalatine fossa they follow the names of the foramina. Sphenopalatine is through the sphenopalatine foramen. You have the pharyngeal through the pharyngeal canal. You have, again, we, we said we have nine openings, three posterior, three inferior, one medial, one lateral, and one superior. So those nine openings, they have nine different arteries. They follow the same names. And it's important to know the different, uh, the different segments of the IMAX. So the IMAX is divided into three uh, segment. One segment is usually when it passes behind the, the angle of the mandible. And this segment, the most important branch is the middle meningeal artery, which is uh, the important part here. Then you have the segment in the perigoid fossa, which is all the muscles of masticators. And the most important branch is the deep the, the deep temporalis based on which we use the temporalis muscle. And then we go, once we pass the pterygomaxillary fissure, it becomes the pterygopalatine segment with all the vessels that we discussed earlier. And this is a, sl a slide that shows, uh, yeah, Alex, if hey you guys. can just give us a couple of minutes. So as you see here, this is the middle meningeal artery. It's important, it goes through spinosome. And you know, when you have uh, absence of spinosome, it means that there's no middle meningeal artery. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And this is to show you the middle meningeal artery around which the auriculotemporal nerve forms a loop. And you have to remember, or the auriculotemporal nerve is a branch of V3 and you can have tumors of the parotid that can invade the auriculotemporal nerve and hit V3 and go retrograde to the cavernous sinus. And uh, you remember, absence of spinosum means no middle meningeal. So if you don't have any middle meningeal uh, artery, then you're gonna have persistence of the stapedial. So the stapedial artery, when it persists, it is a branch of the internal carotid because spinosum is, uh, is occluded. And this is from the side when you're doing mandibulectomies. You have to be careful when you remove the condyle, the, the IMAX is right behind the condyle in its first segment. What do we have next? Let's go quickly. If you have named arteries, you don't have named veins. You have a plexus of veins. You, they, they do not have names. It's a plexus. So that's why anytime we do surgeries in this zone, you can clip the arteries, but you have to put the surgery cell or gel foam on the veins. The nerves are important in this zone because they can uh, uh, help cancer spread medially and distally. And as we said, the greater superficial petrosal nerve has parasympathetic and sympathetic. The parasympathetic, they go straight to the ganglion and you have the parasympathetic post, the post the synapse, they go right from the pterygopalatine ganglion to the lacrimal gland and to the mucous gland of the sinuses and some of the palate. As we said earlier, the sphino, the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion is the largest parasympathetic ganglion of the head and neck. Imaging and pathology, we can go very quickly because we presented lots of scans previously. So Again, it's very important for perineural spread. This is, this is why it's a very important area. You have the nerves, any cutaneous skin cancer. I'm just going uh, quickly. We will talk about that hopefully in this afternoon when we talk about the nerve sheath anatomy. So you have the three connective tissues, 
with the endoneurium around the axons and then the perineurium and you have the uh, epi on the, on the surface and any tumor, as you see in here, when it invades the, the perineural space, like this one, this is what we call perineural invasion. Some pathologists, they say if you have involvements of 30% of the nerve sheath, you have perineural invasion. Our guys at Markey and the pathologist, they want to see the tumor invading the perineural space. So this is why, you know, how cancer spread. We can quickly, quick, uh, go through these. Again, perineural spread, you see it. We have cutaneous cancers. They hit the infraorbital nerve, they go retrograde, they reach the fossa, rotundum, cavernous sinus. And I wanted to show you one more slide. These are the international, uh, because skull-based cases are not very, very common, in uh, uh, 2008, there was 17 different departments. They put cases together and they had about 1,300 of skull-based cases based on pathology, histology, et cetera. And they found that despite having positive margins in any skull-based case in a third of the cases with complications, mortality is still low, recurrence is still high. And this is, you go quickly, negative margins, positive margins, and a similar slide for positive perineural invasion and negative perineural invasion. Lots of cancer. Let's show you just some cancer before I, I finish. These are some cancers with perineural invasion, adenocystic, squames, mucoapyhydrate, basal cells, they can invade nerves, melanomas, lymphomas, they can invade nerves, rhabdo, and metastases. And we can, we can have benign conditions, like even mucormycosis. This is a patient when I was a fellow at Davis. You can see he had optic neuritis and uh, cavernous sinus involvement, and he had mucormycosis. Unfortunately, he died after several, eight, nine months after we operated on him. Surgical approaches, we're going to go very, again, less than a minute, I'll be done with this conference. So you can see it's a, the Ombrens line. It's a line that goes from the medial canthus to the angle of the mandible. Uh, we don't use it nowadays, but it's still, for the boards, they still like it. Uh, we know that the tumors that are located sup superior to this line are more aggressive than the ones below, just because of proximity to those nerves and to the orbit and the skull base. So the pterygobatine fossa is usually in there, as you see. It's, it's in this, the, the Ombrens line was described several decades ago. So we didn't have the adva radiological advances. It was based on regular x-rays from the side not on scans or not on any endoscopic stuff. And this is a very old slide. Access to the fossa, you can go either from the front. As we said, it's a cavity, 3D dimension. You can go straight front to back. You can go from the side. You cannot go from the top because it's going to be transcranial. You can reach it from, from below. But the only thing that we do from below when you do sinus surgery with coma or uh, you, you inject lidocaine or epinephrine, just in the foramen. You have to go about like five, six millimeters, aspirate, and then simply do the block. But most of the accesses are anterior or from the side. And we can skip this one. As I said, lots of fat in the fossa. In the past, they used to go Caldwell lock. This is one of the, when I was a resident, <laughs> wow, 18 years ago, we had a patient with a simple epistaxis. We had to put in a, you can see, she has a, an endotrach, a, a tube, ET tube through the nose, and we inflated the balloon because we didn't have any Foley. So we had to use an ET tube, inflate, and then push anterior and put water in the balloon and pack. Anyways, we used to go, we did not go endoscopic. Again, we are getting old. We used to do a Caldwell lock and use the microscope, identify the fossa, and you can see, we put two clips on each vessel. And in, when I was a resident, if you see here the left lower screen, we used to have this Cummings. I think it was the fourth edition. In the fourth edition, when you look at the perigopalatine fossa, there was no endoscopic approach. Those are the approaches that we use in skull base. And when we finished our fellowship, they started talking about endoscopic approach. Again, I was talking 2000, I was a fellow in 2007 and the 
sphenol, the nasoceptal flap was popularized in 2008 after Pittsburgh published their, started publishing. So it was evolving and here you go. Now it is very important as uh, Bryce did in his presentation. Bryce, my, this presentation is maybe 10, 12 years old. So I was there first. So I added the endoscopic approach uh, to the textbook anyways. And endoscopic anatomy, you know the endoscopic anatomy. This is one of my cases, the patient's on the right side. And here it's a little bit hard for you to see, but this is vidian nerve, okay? This is vidian nerve. And there's another slide that shows it better. We're removing the tumor endoscopically. I was a fellow back then, it was 2008. And this is when we did the cleaning endoscopically. So this is vidian that you see clearly. We opened it completely, the sphenoid sinus. And this is rotundum with V2. Again, I was a fellow and I did this case. It was 2008. And open approaches, we can skip them. You can see those, uh, hope, you know, sometimes we do once every month or so. Very, very important, very dear to me. And this is the skull base that Paul Donald wrote. He wrote the first textbook on skull base surgery. So I was the, his fellow for three years. So I know his textbook by heart. Anyways, and this is, again, infratemporal fossa. This is what we like to do. Guys from Italy describe this approach, and you've seen me do it. If the tumor does not involve the anterior wall of maxillary sinus, we simply remove the bone, and uh, we plate it at the end to conserve the anatomy. And take some examples. More, more approaches, mid-facial degloving. I've done only two cases at UK in nine years. We almost don't do it anymore. This is basically to simply not have any cutaneous uh, incisions. And in the mid-facial deep loving, you have to make four different incisions. Hopefully you can just read about four, four incisions that you make to make the mid-facial deep loving. This is uh, from that textbook. And infratemporal fossa also, I was lucky because the guy in ENT who described it was Paul Donald. Uh, so we, we, we have to know this fossa by heart. So. And you see, we remove this bone and we put it back at the end. Anyways, we can talk about that later. Pathology, I'm gonna be basically skipping them, showing you just the slides. This is a schwannoma. They say schwannoma is the most common tumor of the pterygopalatine fossa, but when I give the lecture in the afternoon, another reference, it put JNA now as the most common. So again, schwannoma, you can have inverted papillomas with perineural spread. You can have squamous cell carcinomas. You can have, again, involvement, as you see here, thickening of the nerve. You have to know what are the different, let's say this picture, uh, this is an MRI, and you have to know the signs of in perineural spread of an MRI. One, you can see enhancement of the nerve. Number two, thickening of the nerve. Number three, destruction or enlargement of the bone foramen. And number four, you can have a skin cancer, but disease in the uh, cavernous sinus. So there's a skip tumor. I have a vi two videos of patients with squamous cell carcinoma of the nose and they have lateral rectus palsies. So I don't know if I have them in, the, uh, in this lecture, but I should have them in the malignant sinonasal tumor. And same thing, you can see perineural spread. And uh, I will, I'm gonna finish with this one. It's a very interesting, if you like art, I really like art myself. So this is from uh, Rembrandt. Rembrandt, in fact, was a Dutch painter. He painted this one about 400 years ago. And uh, at that time, they only had one anatomy lecture every year. And it has to be a criminal that, uh, uh, this guy was a criminal uh, after a robbery, and he was basically hanged and died. And you can see they are always very well dressed. Although he's an anatomist and professor back then, he was not the one who dissected the, the, the cadaver. There used to be somebody uh, they call the preparator. So the preparator is the one who prepares the cadavers for them with all the dissection. And people in the audience need, needed to pay a fee to attend the lecture, including those people. And in the specific uh, uh, picture, this is the first time, as you see here, that Rembrandt signed his full name. 
he used to put his initials RHL, but this is the first one when he put his name because he was known, he was 26 years old. And those three in the back, they think they were, they were included to the picture, but they were not present. It was this uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Taup, along with these four people, and those three in the background were only added later, but they were not in the audience. And this was not accurate. It was anatomically uh, very well and pretty described, but just uh, the orthopedic guys, when they have regular cadavers, the epicondyles are reversed. So they question this actual accuracy of the picture. And this is one of the textbook, as you see here, it's, it's an Italian guy who wrote it. So they should not have blood when they do these dissections and they used to do them once a year. So this is what I have. Again, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. It didn't connect and finally it worked. Questions? Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, let me know this afternoon. I'm giving the benign, the lecture on benign sinonasal tumors so we can answer them back then. Okay.